So I got this idea from Steven Westner, uh, a great marketing mind guy. And you know, the, the concept is cornerstone content. And then the smaller pieces are what you would call cobblestone content. And the people that you're connecting with, even if they never become clients, they need to be aware of those things. If you want people to talk about you as organically as possible without having to incentivize somebody to do that, they need to actually be prepared. Something I've noticed as we've gone through the years here is people have gone away from the idea that they love to be communicated to in, in a mass market way. The moment you stop paying for ads, if you don't have an organic traffic, if you don't have people organically endorsing you, if you don't have cheerleaders, if you don't have a system that brings in people organically, your traffic dies the moment you stop spending money. Welcome to the Lunch Break ABCs. This is episode 14 of the Lunch Break ABCs. I'm Brandon Eastman. I'm joined by Andrew Biernat over here, Christine Smith right here, and Ben Albert right down here in my bottom right, which should be the same for you as well. And we are the Lunch Break ABCs. We meet monthly in order to bring you new tips, strategies, stories, and or philosophies that will help you to better operate your business so that you can better operate your life. And you vote on our topics, and you voted in a landslide on this topic today. You really wanted to hear about how you can grow your business using organic reach. And we're heading into 2024 here. All right, we've got a month and like 10 days left in 2023. Constantly, the methods of organic reach change. The marketing efforts change. Social media changes. The platforms change. The strategies change. But there are principles that are set in stone. But today, we're going to talk a bit about the principles of organic reach. What is organic reach? What's the difference between that and the alternatives? As well as how can you reach more people using organic reach in 2023? 24. You wanted to hear about it and we brought it to you today. So who, who wants to kick us off here with your thoughts on what is organic reach? Because we got a lot of people listening who have a business, a brand, a product, and they built something great. And now they're like, no one knows about this thing. I have to, I have to put this in front of people, right? And how do I go about putting this in front of people? What is the beauty of organic reach in your opinion? In two words, it's free. <laughs> it's free pay-per-click paid advertising that's a whole new conversation but the moment you stop paying for ads if you don't have an organic traffic if you don't have people organically endorsing you if you don't have cheerleaders if you don't have a system that brings in people organically your traffic dies the moment you stop spending money so it's free and it creates a baseline that you can do paid, you can do a million things, but if you don't have people coming to you organically, all those other things generally aren't scalable. And how can you beat free at, at the end of the day? How can you beat free? How can you beat authentic? How can how can you beat organic? I think it's I think it's key. So let me ask you, Ben, because I know you're you're huge when it comes to specifically the marketing space, right? Your business is built around marketing. How much of your strategy now, years into this, because you started during the pandemic 2020, how much of your strategy now is organic versus paid? And how did it start? 98% organic. <laughs> I just started running paid ads on YouTube, and I actually don't really even know what I'm doing yet. It's been 100% organic from the start. Um, now, granted, I was starting as a sole proprietor bootstrapping with a budget of zero. My actual budget when I got started was stimulus check money and part-time unemployment money was my budget for my business. Pay the bills, take an extra $100 a week, and find some new tool that I can help utilize. But really, it was just messaging people on LinkedIn, starting a low-budget podcast, um, beginning conversation. So I started 100% organic. And I'm still 98% organic. I'm just running YouTube ads as kind of like an experiment to see how it works. Um, but I don't utilize that to make any money right now. It's 100% organic. That's awesome. So I think it's important for an episode like this to maybe give some context about what each of us do. The mm -hmm. reason being is each of us has a very different product and thing that we are marketing. So as an example, I have a podcast 
that I use in order to market what I do as a corporate trainer, sales trainer, a personal development trainer inside of corporations. Okay, so I'm selling a service, not a physical product. It's physical in the sense that I'm there, but it's not something that I hand to somebody or ship to somebody, right? So Andrew, can you give us an idea of what you do? Yeah, so for, you know, it kind of depends on, you know, the audience too, right? So for for us, you know, we all have podcasts. We, you know, podcast is kind of a part of our organic reach and a part of our kind of creation and, and content that we build. Uh, not everybody does. Uh, because it does come at a cost, both in time and in finances, to run that, to, to make that happen. Um, and so, so yeah, for me, I like podcasting because um, you can do a couple cool things with a well-designed show. Uh, so example for, for Brandon is a, a well-designed show is going to appeal to an audience of ideal customers. And if you can engage in interesting conversations with interesting or authoritative people and then break that bigger content up, right? Because if you're recording something for 45 minutes or an hour, not everyone can tune in for 45 minutes or an hour. But if you can then take that bigger piece of content, break that into smaller chunks and then share those smaller chunks as little nuggets of wisdom, that's how you're going to show up in the easiest way for your audience to consume. Then they find the small little bits and pieces of it. They have a couple nibbles and they say, oh, this is really good. Um, let me maybe take a big bite of the bigger thing, which maybe is a podcast. But uh, your bigger thing could also be a book. It could be some specialty research or, or field work that you've done. It could be uh, really any big chunk of stuff that you've put a lot of effort into that now you can break little chunks off of to make other content. Uh, so I got this idea from Steven Westner, uh, a great marketing mind guy. And you know the, the concept is cornerstone content. And then the smaller pieces are what you would call cobblestone content. And so you take that big cornerstone, you chip little pieces off of that. And then those little pieces are what your audience can consume. And it's how people can find you. So that's one piece is, is like building an audience, right? And when you build an audience, you can, in a sense, kind of direct things on what you want them to do, what their action steps are for you. Um, and some of those action steps are to most of them should be to benefit your audience. Some of them are mutual. They're going to benefit you and they're going to benefit your audience. Um, that's kind of like the, the jab, jab, right hook kind of idea. Um, and so with a podcast, though, or any other kind of media that you're creating, you can also, not only are you making content that's ideal for your ideal customer, but you can also invite your ideal customer onto your show uh, and say, hey, ideal customer, let's do an interview together. Uh, and there's no way to build rapport faster than by co-creating content together. Um, and so, yes, it may be a little bit of a selfish move to kind of bring someone on, um, but at the same time, they're getting value out of it. Otherwise they wouldn't have showed up. They're get to promote their brand or promote their product or talk about their business. Um, but at the same time, now you've built rapport with this person and then offline, you can then kind of lean into that a little bit and open up some conversations for possible next steps with that person. Um, and so there's a lot of really well done podcasts that kind of follow both of those pieces where they they're both marketing to an audience, but then some of their audience comes on the show and they get to market to them uh, in person or directly. Yeah, that's fantastic strategy, 100%. So if you had to say in one sentence what you do, what your product and business is, Andrew, what would you say? Yeah. So for me, I specialize in something similar to Brandon. So I'm, I'm more in the kind of speaking, education and training realm of things. And so for me, I'm actually in the midst of a, uh, a retooling. So I'm focused more on remote organizations and specifically around some of the biggest challenges they're facing. Uh, so burnout uh, challenges uh, as far as kind of employee turnover, like just just the, the, the big challenges of remote work that are different from in-person work. Because uh, in person, it's a lot more social, a lot more interaction. Uh, and we're in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. Uh, and some of that is exacerbated by remote work, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, and so, you know, you hear all the time about culture. You hear all the time uh, about, uh, you know, loneliness and burnout and all these other challenges. Um, and they can be worse for remote teams. But at the end of the day, they don't necessarily have to be. And so that's kind of where, where I step in. Uh, and that's some of what I do is kind of help organizations kind of retool things so that those problems aren't manifesting in the other problems within their business. 
That's great. That's great. And for everyone listening to what you just said, Andrew, that was a very great 30 second commercial on who it is that you are. Right. And I don't know if there was a whiplash statement in there, but it was a fantastic 30 second commercial. And you have to be able to, to do that. Right. You have to be able because you and I are similar in the way. So we're similar and then we're different from the other two, Ben and Christine, in the way that the product is us right? We are the brand. You and I are the product, the brand. So the content that we are putting out there, the organic reach that we're putting out there are things to build trust and build connection with our audience and ourselves as the product and brand, right? So Ben is different. Ben's, I, I guess Ben is similar in some ways to that as well, but different in the fact that Ben, you actually have a product that, and a service product essentially that you help people with. So what, tell us about you, Ben, what do you do? I'm boring. I, I just sit around and <laughs> chat with people all day. You know, at, at the core, you know how just about everybody wants to be successful. They want to create a legacy. They want to build a business. My role in all I do, and there's multiple segments, I don't want to bore people. They already know me. It, my, my role is to be a bridge, to be a bridge from getting the knowledge from those who have it to those who need it. The service offerings from those who have it to the clients they can serve for the information from someone who's looking to learn to ultimately connect them with the people, the mentors, the right information to get them to the next level. So whether it's a podcast, whether it's working hand to hand with a thought leader to get their legacy and their wisdom out to more people or a classic ma and pa business like an esthetician that's serving a local community. I'm the boring guy behind the scenes who's just building that bridge to get it from there to there. Um, and it's not that boring. It's tremendously fun. But I like kind of being in the sideline and really just elevating good things. Very cool. Well said. And Christine, you're very different in the fact that you have a brick and mortar business. Yeah. And you have an online business. So you right. have a taste of both of those worlds in a way that none, the rest of us here don't understand unless I'm incorrect there, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have experience in organic reach when it comes to a place you can go and touch with your fingers. Right. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what you do. Yeah. So, um, I own a co-working space, um, in the area that I live in upstate New York. And then I also have a networking group that, that became digital <laughs> inadvertently because of COVID. And then it just kind of stayed that way. Um, and it's combined with the co-working space. So when, um, you know, and, and I'm in the marketing space and have been for, uh, a very long time. And, you know, we get this, this conversation all the time, you know, well, how do I get as free and as organically as possible, right? Because um, no one wants to pay for for customers half the time. And you know, being in the same boat as a business owner, it's like, okay, what can I do for you know the least amount of money? But I think what people miss in the organic piece, whether you have a digital a digital presence uh, with your business or you know you have a brick and mortar, um, you have to do things intentionally with that organic piece. So we we have um, hanger influencers. So people that are members in the space, um, they get a, an extra perk um, with a different type of membership in exchange for promoting the space. So again, the intentionality behind, okay, I need other people to talk about my business. I can't talk about the business. And people will be like, oh, yeah, 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 sure, right? Um, other people's voices are always going to speak louder. And, and this is how I work in the marketing realm too. Like I'm really big on the human component and testimonials and other people talking about people's businesses because people connect way better to those things. And even with, you know, my networking company, Ripple Effects, it's the same type of mentality, right? You want to have those connections but the connections don't come until somebody says something, right? Like somebody has to say, well, I'm looking for blah, blah, blah. And then other people are like, oh yeah, no, I know somebody, or I know somebody that knows somebody that can potentially help you, right? And people aren't wired that way. Like that's not a normal conversation. People aren't, they're connecting the dots from here to here. They're not planning out the dots from here to here to here to here to here because that's actually how like a sales cycle is. It's not from here to here. If it was, I think everyone would be much more successful, right? 
um, it's very like convoluted and people are very distracted. There's a lot of different options and things that are going to pull us away from making that decision at that time. We had somebody come in today and she's like, I just need to get out of my house. She's like, I need to make the conscious effort for my mental health to leave and not work at home all the time. Like that's what she said. And I thought it was interesting because it's not even like we have those conversations, but okay, well, how do I continue connecting those dots for people and doing it over and over and over again, not just in a social media post, not just in OTT, you know, not just at an event, like other people have to have those conversations for it to essentially ripple out into the world, right? And it reverberates back. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So now we have a really good background of what each of us do, right? So one of the next pieces, because we're, we're heading into the new year here, right? People are launching new products. People are running Black Friday sales. People are wondering, how can I put more attention on what it is I do, my brand or my product? And a big part of that is, what have we learned in the time that we've been doing this? So Ben, you been, you've been doing this since 2020. I started my business technically in 2019, even though I didn't really get deep into it until 2021. That was a couple of years of learning there. But I'd like to I'd like to know from each of you, and I'm going to share a story as well of what have you learned in the four, five, six, seven, eight, because I know you've been doing this for a while, Christine. What have you learned about marketing in this time that you wish you knew at the very beginning that could help someone tuning in right now to kickstart their progress and avoid some of the, the mistakes that we've made? Because if I, I look at this as a three-step process, okay, and there's many little steps in between, but if we look at business and selling a product and sales as a three-step process, you've got number one, Who's, who's your ideal client? Who are you looking to help? Who are you looking to serve? Who are you looking to reach with your organic reach, with your marketing, with your services, your product? And then you've got number two, which is what is your product? What is your offering, right? You can't have number two before number one because you need to know who you're helping. You need to know who you're serving. So number two is your product. And then, so today we're talking about step three of three. We're talking about the marketing of the product to the client today, but that's step three. Right. So know your client, create an offer, to serve them, solve a problem, most importantly. And then step three is the marketing, the organic reach. So my biggest mistake was I started with number three. OK, I started with number three and it was a mistake, but it was also a good thing because I learned. Right. I learned how to create content. I learned how to market, how to make posts, how to go in front of the camera, how to be on podcasts, all those things. But my first year and a half. I didn't know who I wanted to serve. I thought I was helping everybody. I said, I want to help everyone live a better life, which is true. But in business, that's not really a recipe for success, right? So I was looking to help everyone. But if someone messaged me and said, Brandon, I, I want to give you money. How can you help me if I give you money? I would have been like, uh, I don't know, right? I don't know what to give you. So I didn't have a product. I didn't have a service. And I started with step three. So I started creating YouTube videos in 2019. And I was decent at it because I did training before. So I got in front of the camera. I talked, I talked about goal setting, limiting beliefs. I talked about all these things, fitness wise, emotions wise, all the, all these things. And I started to build a little, a little audience there. Okay. But again, I wasn't making any money because I had no product because I didn't know exactly who I was serving. Okay. So what happened was I said, well, I'm not making any money. I'm not gaining any traction. Maybe I need to pay for advertisements so I can get this message out to more people, right? So I threw money at something that didn't even exist. I poured gasoline on a fire that wasn't even lit. And I spent, and I'm not joking, I had a, a really great role and job when I was doing this. I was spending thousands of dollars on advertisements, right? On my old Facebook page, I had 45,000 followers. I had a lot of engagement on it. But again, because I didn't know who my ideal client was, I was targeting everybody globally. So if you're on Facebook ads and you go to who your demographic is, I was typing in global, right? And people who like personal development is what I was typing in. So I was not being very specific at all. And after I'm putting thousands and thousands and thousands, and I even create finally my first product, I still failed because I was going backwards. I started with the marketing and then I did the product and then I decided who my client was. If I could go back to the very beginning, I would save myself thousands of dollars, which again, gave me experience that I didn't have that now I know how to use. But if I can give you a piece of advice that would help you not make the same mistake, 
rather than start backwards like me and burn money, instead choose who is your ideal client, right? Who is it? Start conversations with them like Christine was talking about. Talk to these people, right? What is it that you need? What is it that you want? If, you, if there was one product out there that would solve everything for you, that would solve one of your biggest problems, what would that be? People will tell you, okay? And you can have these conversations on forums, in person, at networking events, whatever it is. And then create a product that will solve that problem for them. Because once you have the product and you've got the person, if you have a good sample size of people who are, who are testing the product, it works for them, it gets them results, that's when you start throwing the money at it. That's when you start the paid advertisements. That's when you start pouring gasoline in the fire because there actually is a fire at that point. You're not just pouring it on a pile of sticks and whatever else is in the, in the fire pit, right? So one, choose your client. Two, then create the product to serve them. And then we can talk about the organic reach. But today, let's assume that you know who you're serving. Let's assume that you've got a product of some sort or you're like Andrew and I and you're selling yourself as the product or the brand and then market yourself organically. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Andrew already gave you some tips. But that's a little bit about my history with learning where does organic reach even fit into the mix. Sorry, I lagged out. Did you ask for me to say something? <laughs> you did. Okay, awesome. Um, so where, yeah, so organic, right? Um, so yeah, my internet's been a, a real treat lately. Um, but, um, you know, so, okay, assuming that you know who your people are, assuming that you have a product that's going to serve them, okay? And if you don't have that, would highly recommend um, $100 million offers and $100 million leads um, as as books to dive into. So I'm, I'm working my way through $100 million leads uh, right now. So Alex Hormozzi, fantastic frameworks that he, he gives you. Um, but let's say you have those things, right? So now you're like, okay, how do how do I... Get out again. Am I back yet? You're back. Hear you. Yep. Oh, yes. You said you're making oh, your way okay. through $100 million leads right now through Alex Hormozzi. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, fantastic book. Highly recommend it, right? But let's say, yeah, you've got all that teed up, right? Now you want to go, okay, how do I organically market my stuff, okay? Um, well, when you know your person, when you know who you serve, you know what their pain is. You know what makes them squirm. You know what keeps them up at night. You know what they don't like. And if you can start talking about those things, sharing about those things, giving solutions for those things, adding ridiculous amounts of value around those things that are challenges for them, they will be drawn to you like a magnet because they want what you have. They want your solution. But again, the only way to know that is to know your people and be talking to them and be in communication with them. Be serving them. Start by serving them first. Don't ask for any money. Like, hey, cool. Uh, you know, if you're a speaker, right? Hey, can I can I do a lunch and learn? Can I do a whatever? Right? And 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 work on solving one of your problems for you. Um, start there, especially, you know, for, for those early in, in the entrepreneurial journey, um, start by giving it away. If you can't give away your service, don't charge for it. <laughs> um, right. That's that, that you'll learn something right there. Right. If people aren't even willing to take this for free, cause free still has a cost, right? It costs them time. It costs them potential reputation. It costs them other things, right? Free still has a cost. If they're not willing to accept your services for free, then you're barking up the wrong tree. You're serving the wrong people. You've got the wrong message or the wrong product. Um, and so you need to make sure that, okay, can I do this for free? But then you start escalating. You start charging a little bit more. You charge a little bit more and you charge a little bit more. But as far as organic, know your people, talk about their problems and talk about it in a way that gets them interaction. So most social media platforms are, are grading what we do uh, based on how long people's eyeballs are glued to it. Right. So when you look at social media, it is how long can I keep people addicted to my platform? Because then I can show them more advertisements and then I can make more money. Right. So think in the mind of your platform. Right. You're on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, whatever else. Right. They have revenue generation that they have as their core goal. That's it. Everything else is in service to revenue generation. And so you need to feed into the things that are going to help them make money. And that is keeping people invested on the site, which means you're going to want to create content in such a way that it keeps eyeballs and attention glued to what you're making. Excellent advice. Very cool. Okay. So I'd like to ask each of you then, when, when do you ask for the sale? So if we think about what is the purpose of this organic reach? So now we understand, we, we understand who our client is. 
We know what their problem is. We're solving their problem with our content, like you just mentioned, Andrew. And again, we can talk about content vehicles too. We talked about podcasting being one of those vehicles. We talked about a book being another one. There's many different vehicles. But okay, so now what is the purpose of all of our content? What is the purpose? Are we just looking solely to help people out of the kindness of our heart? Maybe, right? But it's nice if we can have a business that brings in money because a business that's not earning money doesn't last very long and then you're out of business, right? So when do you ask for the sale and how do you go about asking for the sale? Do you just make a post saying, hey, would you like to buy this? Do you message people? What, what does it look like and when do you ask for the sale? When is that appropriate? I have a simple answer for this. And Andrew mentioned earlier, jab, 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 right hook. And there's actually math behind that specific concept. Um, let's say you're watching a 30 minute program. What percent is the actual show and what percent is ads? Generally the shows 22 to 23 minutes and then seven minutes of ads. You watch a 40, uh, 60 minute program. It's about 43 to 45 minutes and then 15 to 17 minutes of the ads. And there's a lot of science behind that three to four ratio. So if it's pure value that people are engaging, boom, 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 ask, boom, 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 ask. That's the general consensus and the typical answer. My untypical answer is I want to put in like a minimum 20 jabs before I even have the smallest ask in a perfect world. I'm creating so much value and so much content and I'm jabbing and I'm just giving so much value, just dropping bombs all day long to the point they ask me. There's nothing better than organic where they start asking you or friends, cheerleaders, clients, people in your world start endorsing you and referring you. So if you're going to ask, don't ask any more than 25% of the time. I mentioned earlier with like 98% organic, I'm nine, I probably make at most, here's the thing. I'll make asks like, Hey, come to my networking event. It's free. Hey, come on my podcast. It's free. Like those are asks I make, but actually asking for business from a random person that I'm not on a sales call with maybe one to four times a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to make an ask like that soon. It's coming up and who knows? My assumption is I'm gonna have a pretty high success rate because I jab, 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 value, 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 love, 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 content, 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 helped people for free. So even if my paid stuff isn't that much better than my free stuff, people are gonna wanna buy it because they know that I know what I'm talking about because I jabbed way, way so many times. And just for anybody listening, jab's just a metaphor for value, 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 ask, value, value. I'm thinking value, 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 value. And then and then make a soft ask like, would you be open to having a conversation about this? I don't even jab. I don't, I don't even write hook. I don't even try to knock them out. I add value and then I do a permission-based ask. Hey, are you open to jumping on a call? I have a new launch and I think you'd be a good fit for it. So that's a super soft strategy. But since we're talking organic, if you're so good, if you know your audience, if you speak to them, if you're descriptive not prescriptive you don't just tell everybody exactly what they need you actually describe and show them how it works for yourself your clients and people around them if you do that you're gonna have cheerleaders and ambassadors without even making an ask so at most make that ask one out of four times but for me make the ask as seldom as possible um, and be very strategic with it that was a lot of data, but I hope that's helpful. That was really good. There, there's one thing that I really would love if you talked about throughout this at some point, Ben, because I'm going to ask you questions about it, which is the use of your email list. Because I get emails from you all the time. I read every one of your emails. They're always very heartfelt. It sounds like you wrote the email, which I know you did. And those emails you use in many different ways. You use it for grow getters. You use it for the products. You use it to survey your audience. I want to ask you about the power of an email list because that's one other thing that I failed to have at the very beginning of my business. 
And what you just described there was, okay, you're providing so much value for people. You're creating so much content that's only solving a problem. And the last line of your content doesn't say, hey, message me if you want to buy this, right? It's just, hey, this is the problem. This is how you can overcome the problem. What are your thoughts on this? What strategies do you have about overcoming the problem, right? And then you've got 40 comments below saying, oh, this resonated with me. This is what I do. This is what I do. I liked how you said this, right? And then you get an email from Susie and it's like, Ben, I was wondering, maybe, you know, would you be able to help me with this one-on-one? -on -one? Would you be able to privately coach me on this specific thing? And if that's in line with what you offer, then, then maybe that's something you would do. So you've got inbound leads because if we're thinking about what is organic reach for it's to generate leads okay we've got inbound leads people messaging you and we've got outbound leads you going out there and like what you said messaging someone saying i've got a launch coming up you'd be a perfect fit at the beginning i find that it's 99 percent outbound if you're looking to make sales if sales is the number one objective you need that cash coming in like when, when you got laid off in 2020 you you had to supplement your income you had to bring it in. So I can guarantee that there was a large portion of what you were doing that was outbound, but eventually it becomes inbound. Like as an example, I talked to so many people. A lot of my clients are people who've been on my podcast and they've been on the podcast. They've been a guest. And then I send them all the clips of the podcast. We say in communication, they get my emails, they see my posts and they're like, Hey, I've got a marketing question that Brandon would know, or Hey, I'm a manager at this company and we've got a lunch and learn that we're, we're looking to find a speaker for, or a conference or whatever. Like a couple of weeks ago, I got a message from someone I knew from a mastermind group who's, who's been on my show. And he's like, Hey, I'd love for you to come out to our conference in Washington to give a presentation, be one of the keynote speakers. And I was like, awesome. Like I didn't message him asking if I could be a speaker. He asked me because I've built up trust with him and he, he knows what he's getting, right? Because it's like, he knows me because one, we've been on the podcast together, but two, he's seen my content over and over and over. So he feels safe in his decision to bring me in, right? So that's an inbound lead. So I definitely want to ask you at some point, Ben, about your use of your list and where that comes into play when it comes to organic marketing, because I guess it does cost you money to have an email list in terms of paying for the software, but in terms of the marketing aspect of it, it's a list of people that is free for you to reach out to. It's powerful. I think it's also the, the non-confrontational approach when you're using organic. Um, it's like people just are like, oh, well, people will find me because I have a website where I have socials and I'm like... Yeah, that's not how it works. They don't just magically, you don't they, you know, you don't bill it and they come. That's not how it works, you know, unless you're somebody who's already successful in other businesses. Um, you have to have your reputation speak for itself, right? And I think it's important to whether you're doing like offering resources, but other people have to continue the conversation. And I think going back to like, I know we're talking about the, you know, the actual organic reach, but going back to the beginning, um, when you're doing that market research, like you have to be very specific to other people on what it is you're looking for and what it is that you're solving for. People usually make the mistake of, you know, Brandon learned it the hard, I think we've all learned it the hard way. Like, you know, you can't cast a wide net, um, but they're also talking about, the like the solution to problems that people don't all have like you're talking about things backwards so like i'll pick on like a financial advisor because i used to do that like we were taught to like our elevator pitches were tailored to be like oh i'm looking for somebody who has two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank the problem with that ask is nobody is walking around talking about that like that's not a normal conversation when you're just out in the public, right? Maybe if you're having a conversation with like a mortgage person, you could be that specific. Hey, you know, if you happen to see somebody because they see all that stuff, right? Or if you talk to a CPA or accountant, they're going to have that information. But if you're just in a room with a bunch of people of varying industries, like that information is going to go by the wayside. Like you're not going to find anybody unless they're like, that's them. And there's a really good chance they're probably being managed right now, right? But what is the problem that they're having? They don't like how their money is being managed. 
Um, no one has actually thought through a full-fledged plan for them. Um, they're not doing other things that that person feels their money should be doing right at that time. So you're talking about like the things that they're having conversations about. What are those things? What are the things people are saying and complaining about um, and you know they're unhappy with or they don't know that they need? I think that's the other thing people make the mistake is they think everyone needs whatever it is that they offer. Well, no, they don't, right? Like not everybody needs a co-working space, but who are the people that would benefit from a space like this? People that work from home that are somebody, because some people thrive in a home environment. They don't need to be in this space, right? But like the woman that came today, like they don't function 100% well at home. They need to have an outlet where they have a focused space that's dedicated for work and it's not on their property, right? Away from the kids, away from the laundry, away from an annoying pet, like any of those things, right? What are those pain points that you're experiencing? And the people that you're connecting with, even if they never become clients, they need to be aware of those things. If you want people to talk about you as organically as possible without having to incentivize somebody to do that, they need to actually be prepared. And I think people make the mistake that when they give somebody like their elevator pitch, usually elevator pitches are terrible. Like they're not giving the correct information. So now you're relying on somebody else to regurgitate incorrect information to anyone else that they might meet rather than having a couple bullets of like problems somebody is experiencing that always roots back to you, right? Like I am the Obi-Wan Kenobi of networking. If anybody has a networking problem, that's it. I'm the person, right? There's a reason why that works and it can work in any type of business, but you have to set it up for that or there's no conversation. People can't easily do that because it's just not palatable. And I think it goes across the board for anything that you decide to try. You have to assume that people need to see it, hear about it multiple times in multiple different ways and not everything is gonna hit the same way every time. So, so how do you do that then, Christine? How do you become very clear? Like, let's let's say you're that financial advisor. Rather than say, I'm looking for people who have 250000 in the bank account, what should they say? Or what's a way you could tailor that? Because we don't have an, an actual example here. How right. do you become very clear? So when I was a financial advisor, I had to, I had to make this shift, right? Because I hated asking for that because I thought it was... That was dumb. Um, I was like, no one's going to respond to this. Um, I started talking about, well, I really like working with people who are highly successful in their roles professionally, but by the time they get to manage themselves on the financial side, they just kind of like lose steam and they might be addicts uh, with Target, Amazon. They really like to shop, but it's to the point where it's not controlled and it's causing a ripple other places. They're not saving, they're complaining about their debt that potentially has been strapped to them for many years. They're concerned about long-term financial opportunities that they might be missing out on, but it's a, it's a rigorous cycle that they can't get out of. So they're stuck in this hamster wheel and they're like, I know I need to do these things, but these other things need to change, but I don't know how to make those changes. And they're overwhelmed. So as a financial advisor, I would come in and clean up that mess and say, okay, we're going to get out of the hamster wheel. Here's how we're going to do this. Here's, you know, the process, here are the check-ins, whatever, right? And then they would go on their, you know, their merry way. But this methodology can be applied to any industry, right? What are the things that people are complaining about? How do you talk about those things and put them in very short form? So I want to talk with people who do this, this, and this, three or four things, Right. And that's what you tell people. I'm looking for someone who has this issue. And maybe you just tell that person in front of you because you don't need to give them all four points. You just give them a couple. And if you hear, I always tell people, if you hear the following, hey, that might be a good intro for me. That might be someone I can help. What you solve for honestly doesn't matter if people can't connect the dots. So you might say like, um, you know, I offer, I have a dealership and I offer this, these cars and they have all this technology and blah, blah, blah. Like you start rattling off with all this stuff, right? All people think about when you do that is the cost. There's zero value built in that conversation. But if you started talking about like, 
hey, you know, I love working with people who love to travel and their kids are away at college and, you know, they're thinking about being snowbirds. We offer vehicles that can accommodate long trips. Um, they, they help with travel destinations. They help you get hooked up with Airbnbs, whatever, right? Then you're like, okay, now I'm connecting those dots. There's a value that's associated with that. And you just want to keep building that up so that by the time you are selling something to somebody or you're you're trying to close that sale, you're also eliminating the, any of the objections that come up with like price, right? That's always an issue every industry has, right? People don't want to pay certain things, but why? Is it because they're not your, they were never your client in the first place? Um, they just aren't a client right now or the value potentially hasn't been built for them to move forward. Like why, why would somebody pay hundred thousand dollars for a new pool versus 40. Like why would somebody like there's a, there's a ton of different industries out there that have competitors, right? Like why would you pay five dollars for a burger at McDonald's? I don't know if they're five dollars, but let's just say, right? And then you go to like a fancy burger place and you paid fifteen dollars. Well why? Why why did why did you do that? Why did you pay ten dollars more for a burger that's not at a fast food place? Most people's response is going to be, well, it's not McDonald's. It's not fast food, but, but is it <laughs> like, was it a gourmet chef made it right? Like it had Gouda cheese on it. You know, it had the little fried onions on it. Right. The presentation is completely different, you know, in that space. And it's very easy. That's a very like quick dot connection. Right. But that can be replicated and has to be replicated in order for your services and products to be out there in, in a reasonable way. It, 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 speaking of the burger, like I have a friend of mine recently. So when you said that, it made me think of it. He was talking about Smash Burger and he mm -hmm. was like, dude, you got to try Smash Burger. And I'm like, really? Is it that good? I'm like, why is it a $17 cheeseburger when I can go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac for six bucks? And he's like, dude, it's something about the way that they cook it. And it's that sauce they use. It's like this mayonnaise variant. He's like, you got to try. He's like, I'm going to buy you one. So he went on DoorDash and he, he got one sent to the store we were working at. And while he did that, I was thinking like, damn, like that company didn't need to spend a dime to get me right. on their, on their customer list. Right. I just, they provided a great experience. They delivered a great product with the burger. And now Ben, my friend is not this Ben, but a different Ben uh, with a longer beard. The other Ben, he was like, you got to try it. Right. So that's organic marketing at its finest. That's word of mouth. Right. And th this right. is again, the inbound lead. So I was an inbound lead for smash burger. And now that's a lot of their business, right? With Tesla, think of Tesla. So what's the biggest difference between Tesla and Apple? Apple spends millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions on marketing. If you turn your TV on, you're going to see an iPhone 15 commercial. If you turn your TV on, you're never going to see a Tesla commercial, but Will you ever see the CEO of Apple? Will you ever see Tim Cook on a podcast? I probably not. I've never seen a Tim Cook podcast. Maybe there's one on YouTube, but how many Elon Musk interviews are there on YouTube? Hundreds, if not thousands of interviews. The man gives his time to, to anyone with a, a decent platform to talk about Tesla, to talk about him, because again, he is his brand, but he also has the product that is at, that is Tesla. So again, he strictly markets organically. This man understands the power of organic marketing. And, you know, so maybe for the next 10, 10 to 15 minutes here, we could talk about, okay, moving into the new year, what is a strategy or something we can think about or something we can do in order to really grab this organic marketing by the reins. And something I've noticed as we've gone through the years here is people have gone away from the idea that they love to be communicated to in, in a mass market way. As an example, people are less likely when you send them an email to click on the link and buy the product, but they'll be more likely to respond to your message that Ben sent saying, hey, I've got this, this launch of this new course coming out. Uh, I was wondering, would you like to be part of that pilot program? Right. People are looking more for that one on one connection. They're looking more for that one on one approach. Even if you're a bigger business, even if you've got a successful product, asking yourself moving into this new year, how can I make this a more personalized approach? So it seems like I'm talking to this person one on one. Something I love about Tony Robbins is when you watch a Tony Robbins video, it sounds like the man is just speaking to you one on one. 
He's talking to the camera. He's looking into the lens. He says you, not we, right? He's talking to the person. And it's like, wow, he's talking right to me. I feel like I know this man. He's mastered this approach. And a strategy, so that's philosophy, right? But here's an actual strategy. A strategy is, well, what if you can start the conversation by finding out exactly what it is your people need? What if you're connected with your ideal audience on LinkedIn or your ideal audience on Facebook or wherever you are, Instagram, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. What if you released a survey and you asked in this three or four question survey, what is the number one problem you are facing when it comes to this? One of my favorite questions to ask is what is the one thing that is stopping you from performing at your peak? People will tell you, right? And they will not be bashful. Like they will go deep. You're going to get paragraphs of free data. This is the best free market research you'll ever do. Because then at the end, you write in the survey, hey, if there was a program or a product that solved that exact problem for you, would you be interested? And yes, maybe, or no, maybe next time, right? Everyone's going to do yes or maybe. Maybe a few no's, but mostly yes or maybe. So now what do you do with that information from that free survey you just sent out in this free social media platform where people want to help you, right? You reach out to those people individually and you say, hey, Andrew, I noticed you said that you, you're facing this problem. I was curious, would you be open to hopping on a call with me one-on-one -on -one where we can talk about exactly what this looks like in a bit more detail because it's pretty vague what you wrote. I want to dive more into it. It'll help me. Maybe I can provide value for you and help you as well. Are you open to that? Andrew's going to say yes, right? So now you've taken this mass market approach. You've made it one-on-one, -on -one, right? If you have a team, you can send them with someone on your team, whatever it is. You're going to have conversations and conversations are what lead to sales. So make your approach more personal, create that content, but really dig in and find out what do your people need and what do they actually want to buy? What do they want to know? Love that. I want to touch on some of some stuff that both of you guys brought up. And, and one of those things is like the idea of raving fans. And these are the people that like, they're your biggest cheerleaders. They've probably been a customer of yours at some point. They like talk about you to everybody they know in a good way. And those people, man, you cannot have enough of those people. <laughs> um, however, some of your raving fans aren't as vocal. They, they don't rave about you uh, at every opportunity, but when given the opportunity, they love to. And so what you might consider doing, if you already have some customer base or you already have some platform or some people that like you, appreciate you uh, and love supporting you, is you kind of kind of flip the organic switch and there's no better organic growth than the, the growth that comes from your immediate people and then the one degree of separation, right? The next round of people that know the people that you work with. Right. Because guess what? That's, that's exponential change. Right. Maybe you've worked with 100 people, but those 100 people know 100 other people each. Right. And now, boof, all of a sudden, that's a huge amount of people that you can be exposed to. And and take those raving fans or at least those people that have had a good experience with you and leverage that. Lean into that. I think that's probably the, the biggest, biggest mistake is that people make is when you have some success, ask for the next step. Say, hey, you know, you know, let's say you did a, a speaking event, right? Hey, you know, did you, did you, first of all, did you enjoy this? Was this helpful? Did your audience find it useful? Oh my God, you should see the surveys. It's amazing. It's one of the best ones we have, blah, 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 blah. Good. You just got proof of concept that this is a raving fan, okay? When you have that proof, ask for the next step, which is awesome. Thank you so much. You know, I'm on a mission here. I'm working to do blank, right? Don't talk about yourself. Hey, I want to sell you something else right? No, no, no. Right. Uh, go bigger than yourself, right? Go. I'm on a mission to cure burnout in the remote workforce, right? That's my mission. It matters to me because burnout makes everybody worse at work and at home and in the places that they show up that really matter to them, right? Uh, burnout's not good for anybody. It's not good for production, not good for bottom line, right? And so if that's my mission, the mission's what matters. And most people, when they, they hear about a mission, they say, that's awesome, right? And I want to help the mission, Right. And, well, and guess what? If I'm tying my business to that mission, uh, when the mission is served by me, the business is served. Right. And so you say, hey, I'm on the mission to do blank. Um, I'm looking to get in front of more audiences. 
you know, what's what's a way that, uh, you know, is there someone that you can introduce me to um, that would be you think I'd be a good fit for helping helping their business or helping their people or helping with blank, whatever it is that you do. Right. And now you've taken this this interaction right with a decision maker that knows other people. They appreciate you. They like what you've done already. And the, the beauty of organic now is is we already have relationship. And let's start another relationship with a third party, right? We've, we've taken this one, this zero degrees of separation, and now we're adding one degree. We're getting one more person here involved. And then they can connect you to that person. If they're a raving fan, they will connect you. Um, now, if they say, yes, let me get back to you, don't forget to get back to them, right? Follow up with them and then get that referral because referrals are the easiest way that most people overlook for growing your business organically. If you can, if you can deliver an excellent service or product, aim for a referral from those people that appreciated it, right? Just like the, the burger example, right? The raving fan. Um, now, if I'm the burger joint, I'm going to give my raving fans opportunities. I'm going to say, hey, did you love your burger today? If they have the app, did you love your burger? Hey, give this, uh, you know, send this code to one of your friends and then get their burger at 98% off. You know what I mean? And they're going to thank you because you just made their lunch. Um, you know, and so now all of a sudden now their best customer, someone who, you know, maybe they filled out a survey or something that, you know, that proved that they're a raving fan right now, they can refer other people to the business. You just open up that door of opportunity. Um, and if you do that on a regular basis, you will get massive organic growth, but you have to ask for it. Oftentimes they're not going to do it on their own. You just got to ask I, my, one of my first sales managers, her name was Sandy. She had this really thick Long Island accent. And at the very end of every email and the end of every meeting, she would always say, and remember, just ask. She would say every time, just ask. <laughs> and it's so true though. I mean, Christine, we had that, we had a client where at the end of what we did for them, we're like, Hey, you know, this seemed to have worked out really well for your team. Can you introduce us to one or two more people who we could help as well, right? It's always uncomfortable asking that question, but it's never uncomfortable to the person being asked. If anything, they want to help you. They just don't know how to help you until you ask that question. It's so freaking important, man. Great point. I think it's one of those things like people make it uncomfortable. Like it's really not to ask. And one of the things, especially when I was a financial advisor, a lot of the advisors would never ask for referrals because they, especially if that person didn't work with them, they're like, well, I didn't provide value. I'm like, you have to get like value is like different for every single person. You just connecting someone else to somebody or just giving them a tip or like, you don't know how you provided value for them. So stop making the assumption that you have to bring them all this free stuff in order for them to want to talk about you. And, you know, going back to, you know, essentially how do you ripple yourself out organically. You have to talk to people and you have to ask them very specific things and give them a very specific task. One of the things I did very well as a financial advisor through trial and error, unfortunately, was literally giving them examples of who I wanted to work with and what to listen for. So I wasn't giving them any extra work. I'm like, if you just hear these key words in passing or when you're having a conversation, you know that that person may be a good client for me. So, you know, you can make that introduction or just somebody that I want to add to my network, right? It didn't really cost them any additional time and it was an easy task for them. And I think the referral conversation is something that is hugely missed in sales and a lot of salespeople and organizations. Like I train on this piece specifically in the marketing realm. It should be a part of your process the entire time. You don't ask for the referral at the end. That should be the time that you follow up on the referral. You should be asking for the referral throughout the entire conversation. Like, I would love to be introduced to these types of people. Like, you're asking for a referral without saying the word referral because referral is such a weird word. And I think it's deemed like almost like a banned icky word now. But make it a part of your process. It's going to make things so much easier for you to have other people essentially hunting for you on a regular basis. Great point. How about you, Ben? Any last, any last minute thoughts as we head into the new year with organic reach? Instead of starting a whole new lo loop, I'll, I'll end with all the things you guys have been saying. And I was taking notes. This is 
all stuff that's been said, I'm going to give everyone a formula that's so simple and stupidly obvious that it might be the smartest thing that I've ever done. I hope it's an acronym. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll, I, no acronym yet. Um, create an experience so memorable that people will be compelled to talk about it. Create an experience so memorable that people will be compelled to talk about it. If you really nail number one, you won't even need number two and three. Um, and Smash Burger is an example. It can be little things like, you know, just the way you make your drinks at the bar or having some special thing on the menu that's super obscure, that's Instagram worthy. So every time someone orders that thing from the menu, they're sharing it to their Instagram story. But create, or in my case, I make a cartoon for every podcast guest. I make a trailer for every podcast episode. I try to do things that other podcasters don't. So do create an experience so memorable that they're, they're compelled to talk about it. Number two is ask them to talk about it. And again, if you do number one, they're going to talk about you regardless. But number two is ask them to talk about it. Two B would be something like incentivize them to talk about it, wow. whether it's a giveaway, whether it's a referral partnership, but create a memorable experience. Number two is ask them to talk about it. You can even incentivize that ask. And number three, share their words. So they're, they've already talked about it in a video, in a review, in a testimonial. Just share their story. You don't have to make up a new story. You don't have to be, again, prescriptive and say you know. Just use their words to describe what they said. And then it circles back and it's like an infinity loop. None of this is possible if you're not creating a memorable experience. So create a memorable experience worth talking about ask them to talk about it, then share their words, rinse and repeat, and that's literally all you got to do. I'm going to say this one more time because it's so important. None of it's possible if your experience isn't memorable. So ask, we talked about this a lot, what do my clients, what do the people that I work with, what do they need, who are they, and how can I create a smash experience, a unforgettable experience for them, and then the rest just falls into place. Beautiful. Cap. C, make it compelling. A, ask. ask. And P, pay and or incentivize. But well, there's a third cap part. Share the, a, share the, a, so share their, okay. So that caps, I guess. Caps. You forgot. Because you got to share their experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Well, listen, I hope this episode was compelling enough for you to share it. Um, if it, if, I, hope, I hope it was. And I also ask you at the same time, please, please share this. So that's the A, right? And your incentive is it will boost your status because the person you share it with is going to love it. And they're going to say, Andrew, thanks for sharing that. And that's going to make you feel good. So help us out. Share this episode. Thank you for spending your lunch break with us today with the Lunch Break ABCs. And stay tuned for the next survey and or poll from Mr. Ben Albert that we will share on what our next topic will be next month. Thank you so much, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.